you today, you know, and um, I have many questions for you, you know, I've been, you know, just double checking a little bit of what you've done, you know, it's very, very interesting, you know, uh, you you were the author of, of uh, um, Malignant Self-Love, the, the, the book, you know, which is uh, very interesting, you know, and uh, I first question that I have for you, doctor, you know, is about the cluster B personality disorders, you know, how is possible, you know, for a regular person, for the man of the street, you know, to distinguish someone with a personality disorder, you know, in order, you know, to avoid, I don't know, just a toxic relationship. Well, obviously, people with a cluster B personality disorder are toxic <laughs> and their relationships are toxic as well. I think... Um, there is there are two points of uh, difference one people with cluster b personality disorder especially psychopaths and narcissists and to some extent borderlines they are incapable of perceiving other people as separate entities as external they perceive other people as internal objects or as internal functions they treat other people as extensions or as service providers. They are unable to integrate themselves in a relationship of equals. They cannot grasp the fact that other people have priorities and needs and dreams and emotions and thoughts. And They are so immersed in their own world, all of them, narcissists, borderlines, psychopaths, they are so immersed in their own world that they have no energy left for, for other people. And they would rather uh, treat other people as instruments or as internal objects or as service providers than, than as full-fledged three-dimensional entities which re require maintenance, require investment, require commitment. They're depleted. People with cluster B personality disorders are depleted. It's very, very tough to have such a disorder. And so they are very self-centered and self-focused. Mm -hmm. The second, I said two things. That's the first thing. The second thing is, I think, the fact that they are empty inside. They need the outside world in order to generate, regulate, and maintain internal processes. Whereas in healthy people, everything comes from the inside. In people with cluster B personality disorders, everything comes from the outside. Mm -hmm. The narcissist uses other people to regulate his or her sense of self-worth, self-esteem, self-confidence. The borderline uses other people to regulate her moods and her emotions. The psychopath uses other people, period, <laughs> for money, <laughs> for sex, for power, for anything. So there is an element of exploitation an element of exploitation, which is compensatory. They exploit other people in order to compensate for internal deficits, for internal dysfunctions, deficiencies, and disorder. Mm -hmm. I think these two, there are many other things, of course, but these are the, the two critical facets. Um, it's uh, fashionable nowadays to talk about narcissism, you know, but I would like to to go deeper into the borderline area, you know, the borderlines, you know, you distinguish two, two categories, your main categories, you know, is uh, the, the regular borderline and the covered borderline. What, what are the main differences between one and another? Well, the classic regular borderline has been described in literature for well over 80 years, maybe mm -hmm. 90. So it's very well known and very well studied. But in my work in the field, which is now in its 30th year, three decades, in my work in the field, I began to notice that there is a type of borderline which is very, very similar to a narcissist. Now, we, we have known before about a narcissistic borderline. We've had a concept of a narcissistic borderline. But a narcissistic borderline is a classic borderline who is also grandiose who is entitled. It's a classic borderline who sometimes behaves in a narcissistic way, has a few narcissistic traits, a narcissistic style, but mainly she is a borderline. Whereas a covert borderline, which is a diagnosis that I'm proposing, a covert borderline is a hybrid between a narcissist and a borderline. And these two elements, the borderline and the narcissism, are equal in power. 
they are they are equipotent. Mm -hmm. So both of them play this an important psychodynamic role in the covert borderline. We have a similar situation with narcissism. We have something called malignant narcissism. Mm -hmm. The malignant narcissist is a hybrid between a psychopath and a narcissist. So it's a narcissist who is also a psychopath. And both, both these disorders, the antisocial part and the narcissistic part, they play an equal role. Their fingerprints are recognizable in the dynamics, in the interpersonal relationships, in emotional regulation, in everywhere. The covert borderline is a classic borderline in some cases, for example, in romantic and intimate relationships, it's a classic borderline, but also a classic narcissist, an overt grandiose narcissist in many other cases. So when you put the two together, you get the hybrid. And I think it's a lacuna, I think, I think we need this diagnosis because mm -hmm. I also received many reactions from people saying that they've been looking for this diagnosis all their lives and mm -hmm. this is the answer. And uh, uh, in the case of a cover borderline, you were talking about a primary psychopathy, yes, in some cases, you know, in order to protect themselves, you know, would you define them as psychopaths? You know, these people are at some stage psychopaths or... Oh, yes, first, of all, are... first, first of all, with the exception of the United States, mm -hmm. and to some extent Canada and maybe some parts of the United Kingdom, but mainly the United States, with the exception of the United States, the rest of the world does no, long, no longer makes a distinction mm -hmm. between various personality disorders. For example, in the 11th edition of the International Classification of Disease, which is a book published by the World Health Organization, yes. and the book that the whole world uses to diagnose mental health issues. So in this book, in the ICD, there is no narcissistic personality disorder. Mm -hmm. There is no, there is no specific personality disorder. There is a general diagnosis of personality disorder with various emphases and dimensions and overlays. And so when you're diagnosed in Europe, you're diagnosed with a personality disorder with narcissistic emphasis or personality disorder with dysregulation, emotional dysregulation emphasis, borderline, and so on. Only in the United States, we still have this antiquated system, which is 25 years old, of differential diagnosis. And each diagnosis is a list of criteria. And this list of criteria is mostly about behaviors interpersonal relationships, how, how one functions in society. That's a wrong approach. If you, if you are, if you break rules, if you're defiant, if you're contumacious, if you reject authority, if you're criminalized, if you're antisocial, you're a bad guy, but you're not mentally ill. To call you, to label you mentally ill just because you don't like society and its rules, and just because you break them and you are defined, or maybe just because you are a criminal, to label you, to pathologize you, to say that you're mentally ill, is not professional, is not scientific. So we have a, a major problem with this diagnosis. And so when you ask me if the covert borderline can become a primary psychopath, or whatever, these diagnoses are so counterfactual, so divorced from reality and from clinical practice. Mm -hmm. Every clinician, every therapist will tell you that the same patient on Wednesday, that pa this patient is a narcissist. On Friday, the patient had a fight with his wife, so he became a borderline. And then he had a fight with the therapist and he became a primary psychopath. Mm -hmm. All these disorders are artificial. People with a personality disorder, disorder, disorder are everything at once. The covert borderline could become pri a primary psychopath. Absolutely. Given enough stress, enough rejection, enough heartbreak in a, in a romantic or intimate uh, life, enough criticism and so on, he would react the way a narcissist reacts, essentially becoming a psychopath. Mm -hmm. A classical <laughs> borderline usually becomes a secondary psychopath. When a classical borderline is subjected to stress and to rejection 
and to abandonment and to humiliation, a classical borderline becomes very impulsive. She loses her impulse control. She begins to act out. She goes crazy. She's crazy making. I'm saying she because until recently, the majority of people diagnosed with borderline were women, but it's very misleading because today, half of all narcissists are, are women and half of all borderlines are men. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's true that people can transition from one type of disorder to another because of stress, because of rejection, because of abandonment, because of fears, because of paranoia, because of many things, because of life circumstances, because of crises, <laughs> any number of things. Mm -hmm. And so I, I say that everyone has the potential to be everything, mm -hmm. subject to the environment. It's environmentally triggered. And, you know, I'm going to ask you a question that many people will ask, you know, is it possible to to maintain and sustain a relation, for example, with, I don't know, a covert borderline, for example, in the long run? Yeah, absolutely. Covert borderlines are very committed and very invested in, in their relationships. They are capable of intimacy, true intimacy and true love, actually. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, they are not narcissists. So this is the borderline side of the covert borderline. And the covert borderline is a fantasy of love and invests in this fantasy heavily, idealizes the partner. The covert borderline adores and admires children, wants to have children, and so on. So the covert borderline is a family man or a relationship man or woman. So, and this, is, this sets apart the covert borderline from the narcissist. That's the borderline side. The narcissistic side of the covert borderline has more to do with grandiosity, with the workplace, with uh, ambition and competition, with winning, with standing out, with being noticed, with becoming famous or powerful. Or... So it's there, there are antisocial elements in the grandiose part of the covert borderline. But the covert borderline is actually very close to an ideal partner in many mm -hmm. respects. And why would they discard a partner, for example? Because they discard as well, yes? Not covert borderlines. Narcissists do. Covert borderlines don't discard. Mm -hmm. The beauty in a covert borderline, as far as the partner is concerned, is that the covert borderline is capable of empathy and love, exactly as the borderline is, the classic borderline, same. But he does not devalue and he does not discard it, the narcissistic side of the covert borderline is not manifested in the intimate level. It's manifested in, as I said, in other things. So the covert borderline remains embedded in a relationship and is unlikely to devalue and discard the partner unless and until the partner discards him or cheats on him or breaks his heart or destroys the relationship or something like that. So in this sense, he's not a narcissist. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And um, doctor... Um, Sam, do, Sam, do, please call me Sam. The, Sam, um, do you think that uh, nowadays, you know, the mental health is a main issue in our society at the moment? People are more aware that mental health has a direct impact on our daily lives? There are so many issues nowadays, you know, climate change, mental health, war, maybe nuclear war. I mean, There's so many issues, but you're right that the, the source of all these issues, the foundation, the fount, where it comes from, where everything emanates from, is mental health. Mm -hmm. Because, for example, we have mentally ill leaders, political leaders. Evidently, we have narcissists mm -hmm. and psychopaths as political leaders. Not all, of course, but quite a few. So mental illness is affecting politics. And when you are mentally ill in a position of power, your mental illness is amplified, magnified, and affects millions. You can ask Adolf Hitler if you don't believe me. So here's an example of how mental health uh, determines our lives directly and, and quite directly through politics. But mental health has infiltrated many other fields. For example, mental illness has infiltrated many other fields. For example, gender relations. 
gender relations are broken in large part because women have become much more narcissistic and psychopathic than in the past. And of course, women have become more narcissistic and psychopathic because men have already been narcissistic and psychopathic. It's a reactive, it's a kind of reaction to what is known as toxic masculinity or patriarchy, whatever you want to call it. So, but women have chosen to not be different to men. They've chosen mm -hmm. to be exactly like men. And so they've chosen mental illness, in effect. When you look at, uh, when you look at geopolitics, you have national movements that are essentially victimhood movements. Victimhood is a mental health pathology. Not being a victim. People can be victims. People can be victimized. But when your identity is that of being a victim, that's a mental health pathology. And now when you have national movements, which are essentially victimhood movements, then you end up with Nazism. Mm -hmm. You end up with communism. You, these are all victimhood movements. You end up with the far right. You end up with the far left. You end up with Zionism. You end up with, you know, there are quite a few victimhood movements around. Mm -hmm. And of course, when I mention Zionism, the Palestinians are also not, not uh, short on victimhood. Mm -hmm. When victimhood becomes the organizing principle, it means the totality of international affairs is mentally pathologized. So it's not true to say that mental health is only on, on the individual level. Mm -hmm. You can say mental health is only depression, anxiety. We don't need to worry about it. It's a few individuals and, you know, they take pills and they feel okay and they function and we don't need to think about it. It's not true. Mental, mental illness, for example, is the defining determinant of modern technology. Modern technology was created by mentally ill people, majority of them, schizoids and with other, with other mental health issues. And mental and modern technologies amplify and, and magnify mental health issues. That's why the Surgeon General in the United States wants to put a label on social media and to warn that it is dangerous to the mental health of, of teenagers, of adolescents, mm -hmm. because the technology is sick, totally sick. So it's not true to make a distinction or the delineation and to say mental illness is in the individual realm. We should take care of individuals. Everything is infected. Mm -hmm. We are infested with mental illness, wherever we look, wherever we look. And the outcomes yeah. of this global mental illness is what we see. Coming back to the borderline, uh, to the border, borderlines, you know, I, I wanted to ask you a specific, very specific question. You know, it's about self harm. Would a covert narcissist uh, commit self harm, or is no. the regular borderline? Is that only, regular... only the classic one? Yeah. The classic borderline. Mm -hmm. Self harm, self harm in, uh, in borderline is also goes hand in hand with suicidal ideation. Borderlines are very much into suicide. <laughs> 11% of people diagnosed with borderline personality disorder end their lives with suicide. That's a leading cause of death among people with borderline personality disorder. Mm -hmm. And there are four reasons why borderlines harm themselves and hurt themselves and ultimately commit suicide. Four reasons. The first reason is they are very self-punitive. They reject themselves. They hate themselves. They loathe themselves. They have what we call an internalized bad object or a primitive superego. And so they have these voices inside that keep telling them you're not lovable. You're unlovable. You're unworthy. You are evil. You're inadequate. You are... So they have these voices. And so they seek to punish themselves because it's like if I punish myself, these voices will go silent. It's like sacrificing an animal to the gods, you know? There is an internal God, and you sacrifice yourself to this God in order to shut up the God, to avoid the anger or the wrath of the God. The second reason is to silence the internal dialogue, the internal turmoil inside the borderline. There are multiple voices, conflicting voices. There's chaos, total chaos, tumult, mess, 
we call it disorganized personality organization. So it's a disorganized personality. And to silence these voices, because they're always there, they're very painful, very traumatizing, very hurtful. They push the borderline to kill herself, to harm herself and so on. So to silence them, she harms herself. It's like, okay, I'm going to do what you want. Just shut up, kind of. And, the, and also the pain, when she has physical pain, she forgets the emotional pain, the psychological pain. She focuses on the physical pain. The third reason is a call for help, self-harm and so it's a call for help. And the fourth reason is that when she hurts herself physically, in most cases, but not only physically, for example, promiscuity can be a form of self-harm if you trash yourself sexually. You're punishing yourself. You are demeaning yourself. You're degrading yourself. So it's, it's a form of self-harm. So when she does that, when the borderline does this, she or he, they feel alive. The borderline feels dead inside. Inside the borderline, there is um, emptiness. There is huge emptiness. There's a void. There's a black hole. There are many metaphors. Kernberg called it emptiness. Dustin, Dustin called it the black hole. Everyone came up with a name, but it's a it's a void, and the borderline doesn't feel alive. She feels feels alive only when there is drama, so she needs drama, and the drama needs to include danger and risk. So the drama needs to lead to the potential for self harm, for the borderline to feel alive. The borderline compensates for this emptiness. She has a false self, exactly like the narcissist. It's, it's another type of false self, not the same reasons, not the same dynamics, not the same, but it's a false self. She has a false self, and she has a very rich fantasy life, exactly mm -hmm. like the narcissist. And this is why major scholars, like, for example, Otto Kernberg, suggested that Borderline is a kind of reaction to narcissism. He said borderline is a borderline and narcissism are uh, first cousins. They're they're same family. And he said that borderline and narcissism are on the verge of psychosis. They're almost psychotic because the borderline really has what we call impaired reality testing. She is divorced from reality. This is also common in narcissism. So she sometimes she goes crazy. She becomes super paranoid, the borderline, becomes highly paranoid. Or she under she overestimates how much you love her. She overestimates the intimacy and the emotions in a relationship. This is the same with histrionic personality disorder. And so all this, you put it together, sometimes the borderlines goes so far away from reality, straight from reality, so far, that she is clinically psychotic. She is clinically schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. Initially in the 70s, we thought in the profession that borderline personality disorder is an undiscovered form of schizophrenia. And this is why it's called borderline, because Otto Kernberg said, and others, Gunderson, others, they said that borderline, the, this disorder is on the border with schizophrenia on the border with psychosis so it's borderline that's why it's called border so you see borderline is is very is much more complex than than we think it's just mm -hmm. not just someone who is hyper emotional and a bit crazy and very funny and hugely sexy and this is the stereotype this is the stereotype but the internal landscape is is highly highly complex if you want, I will give you a few more elements. I don't know if you want. Yeah. Do, do, do they feel remorseful at some stage or do they lack empathy as a narcissist? I mean, for example, when a regular borderline, we were talking before that the covert borderline doesn't discard. I guess a, a regular borderline could discard at some stage, very difficult, but could discard a partner. Do they feel remorseful at some stage when they have abused a partner, when they they discard a, a decent guy, for example, you know, at some stage? Unlike the narcissist, the borderline discards only when she feels that she had already been discarded. 
So it's preemptive abandonment. The borderline has two dynamics, two internal dynamics. In her interpersonal relationship, she has two dynamics. Her relationships are very intense. Relationships with borderline are the most intense we know of. They're very intense, and they include exactly like the narcissist. They include idealization and devaluation cycles. That part is true. But, contra to the narcissist, the borderline is motivated by two anxieties. There is abandonment or rejection anxiety, and the clinical term is known as separation insecurity. So the borderline is afraid to be abandoned, to be rejected, to be discarded, to be dumped. She's terrified of this, absolutely terrified. But then, if the partner is loving and intimate and committed and tells her I will never go away, she panics because she's terrified of intimacy. She has another anxiety. It's called engulfment anxiety. So she is like a ping pong ball. We call it approach avoidance repetition compulsion. She approaches and then avoids and approaches you again and avoids you again. Every time she approaches you, she wants you to be there for her like a rock. She wants you to be to provide her with stability, with a secure base. She wants to know that you will never walk away. You will never abandon her. You will never leave her alone. She wants to know this. She wants you as the intimate partner to regulate her moods because her moods are labile. They're up and down all the time. She cycles. She's depressed. She's elated. She's... So she wants you to regulate her moods. She wants you also to regulate her emotion. She has something called emotional dysregulation or, or uh, affective lability. So she wants you to regulate this. She wants you to take over her mind and control her mind for her. She outsources her mind to you as the intimate partner. And your job is to be there 24-7. You should never leave her alone, not, only, not even for five minutes. If you talk on the phone longer than five minutes, you are probably abandoning her. If you travel for work for four days, you have already abandoned her. She is hysterical about abandonment. So, but when she, when she gets what she wants, when she gets a partner who is helpful, who is loving, who is caring, who is compassionate, who is holding, who is always there, she panics because she feels that this kind of partner is going to consume her. This kind of partner mm -hmm. is going to digest her. It's going to swallow her. She's going to disappear inside this partner. So she runs away. So she doesn't discard. She runs away. There's a difference. The narcissist sends you away. The borderline sends herself away. She, uh -huh. she simply runs away. Borderline is exactly like narcissism. is relational. And, and question mark in in if that period you know the the partner decides to discard the borderline, would the borderline hoover at some stage like a narcissist? Yes, borderlines would hoover, exactly like narcissists. And this is part of what I just described: the approach, avoidance, repetition, compulsion. If the borderline is discarded, abandoned, rejected, humiliated in public, for example, and so on and so forth. During that process, that she, you know, just uh, moves, and then away. she, she would, she would uh, go away, but she would be back. Yeah, she approaches and avoids, approaches and avoids. Only when, when if, it... only if the the partner regularly abandons her, humiliates her, rejects her, and so on, she will finally give up on him. But what I I was trying to say is that if the partner feels rejected and somehow, you know, during that process, you know, doesn't understand, you know, the the basically you know the, the the game you know and decided you know to cut you know the 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 um, the relation would the borderline hoover at some stage you know yes, hoover? yes. the borderline would hoover even if she is discarded even if she is rejected even but she would give a few chances and after right. it's at, a, at some point she would begin to regard the partner as dangerous to her not secure base insecure base because when the borderline is abandoned and rejected, she becomes suicidal. Her moods 
go up and down, she cycles. Her emotions, especially negative emotions, especially anger, overtake her, overwhelm her. She drowns. She wants to die, literally wants to die. She considers suicide. She So she, the borderline cannot afford to be abandoned, cannot afford to be rejected. It's life-threatening. So she'll mm -hmm. give you a chance or two chances or three chances. If you keep doing it all the time, then you are threatening her life. And she will walk away and, and forget you. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, yes, she would hoover once or twice. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Doctor, um, what would you recommend, you know, um, to someone, you know, that is in a toxic relationship, you know, what they should do? They should walk away from these kind of relationships? Should they stay? Should they uh, try to search for help for the partner, doctor? Depends. <laughs> Depends what we define by toxicity. Uh, depends how how all pervasive and all pernicious the toxicity is. There are many forms and levels and layers of toxicity and the whole spectrum of toxicity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But definitely, if you are with a narcissist, you should walk away. As narcissists are incorrigible. They cannot be helped. They cannot be changed. They cannot be cured or healed or modified. Mm -hmm. If you're with a borderline, you have to understand that the borderline doesn't have an identity. She has something called identity disturbance, unstable identity. So being with a borderline is like being with someone with multiple personality disorders. It's like being not with one person, but with 10 people or 15 people. If you're willing to share your life with someone who is not the same from one day to the next, <laughs> literally, if you're willing to share your life with someone who is reckless and impulsive, violent and aggressive, angry most of the time, if you're willing to share your life with someone who has no concept of reality, lives in fantasy, and is a bit divorced from herself, she has a false self. If you are willing to live with some, someone who would constantly approach you, love you, and then suddenly run away in panic because you're too much for her, the intimacy is drowning her, she's dying, she's suffocating, she needs the space, she needs time, and she will vanish. And when she vanishes, she is likely to act out, sleep with other men, do crazy things. If you're willing to live with this drama, endless drama, then Maybe it's not toxic. Some people need drama to feel alive. They need drama to feel excited. They need drama to get up in the morning. The borderline, while he, the borderline is very destructive and very dangerous, the borderline is much less toxic than the narcissist. And the psychopath is much le less toxic than the narcissist because the psychopath is goal-oriented. The psychopath wants your money, wants sex, wants power, wants to be famous, and that's it. He uses you, he abuses you, and he gets rid of you. Psychopath will not stay long enough in your life to poison you. You understand? It's transactional. He comes, mm -hmm. he goes, he takes, he walks away. You can be angry at the psychopath. You can be furious at the psychopath. He, he, he defrauded you, he conned you, he stole your money. But, you know, the borderline loves you. Loves you. She's empathic. She is emotional. She is wonderful to be with when she is in a good shape, and so on and so forth. And the price to pay is the fact that she is not the same person all the time, that she's dramatic. She has negative emotions, negative effects that overwhelm her. She cannot control these emotions. She's impulsive. She's reckless. She's likely to hurt you badly. She's likely to run away. She's so, yeah, but there is a human being there. A suffering human being, a broken human being, a damaged human being, but a recognizable human being. Psychopaths are recognized as recognizable as human beings. Because psychopaths want what why want. Psychopaths want what you want. You want sex, you want money, you want to be famous. Psychopath wants the same. The only difference between you is willing to do anything. And you're not. You have morality, you have inhibitions, you have social. You have conscience, you have the social voice in your head. But ultimately, you have a lot in common with the psychopath because he is just an exaggerated human being. You have a lot in common with the borderline because you have also been sad and depressed. You have also you also did crazy things in your life. You also had some drama, you know. 
borderline and psychopath are recognizable human beings, dysfunctional, painful, dangerous. Yeah, I agree, but they are human beings. The narcissist is not. There's a huge difference between the narcissist and borderline and psychopath. When you look at the psychopath, you can say, this is a horrible guy. This is a dangerous guy. I should stay away from him. He will steal all my money. Okay. You know, when you look at the borderline, you're going to say, she's going to hurt me. She's going to, I should stay away. But when you look at the narcissist, there's nobody there. It's an absence pretending to be a presence. It's a, I keep saying it's not fully human, not in the full fledged sense. It's no empathy, no positive emotions, no. All the dynamics inside the narcissist's mind are so alien, so non-human. The, the narcissist is so machine-like. It's it's terrifying. I'm much more terrified by narcissists than by any psychopath or any borderline. Doctor, thank you very much, Sam. Thank, thank you. you very much. The interview has been very, very interesting. And I will send you back, you know, the, the interview once that is published. You know, I'm going to publish it in uh, on the Spanish media. And I hope you like it. You know, it's, it's, this is a, you know, a mesmerizing subject for me, you know, and very, very interesting to talk. Uh, uh, Thank you for having me. Just tell me, um, could I upload it to my channel now? Or would you like me to wait an embargo until okay. after the interview? I, I would rather wait a little bit, doctor. Okay. I would like to publish the interview. Then I would be delighted for you, you know, to okay. download to your channel if you don't mind yes yes of course i will embargo it until the interview is published so i'll wait to hear from you thank you it was thank a pleasure thank you have a Take nice care. day bye-bye